Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, today to today's program. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Libby Daly. I'm the Associate Director of Membership for Mystic Seaport Museum, and it's my pleasure to, to get us started on this journey into Hollywood with our senior curator, Fred Calabretta. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can enter those in the chat feature. If you hover your cursor over the bottom of the screen or if you um, have a tablet or iPhone, you can just touch your, your screen and your options will show you the chat feature and just enter your questions. And at the end of Fred's presentation, I'll come back on and ask those questions to him. Before joining the museum staff, um, Fred experienced an insider's look at the entertainment industry working as a stage technician for Hollywood for several years. So in addition to his expertise in our collections and research, he's also got that insider's look into the movies. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the virtual mic over to you, Fred. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks and, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for your interest in, in, um, in this. And I wanted to also uh, thank Libby and Crystal Rose for their work in organizing this. Um, I, I should tell you, I have to tell you, that um, normally I have a nice uh, virtual background with, with some uh, images related to my presentation um, and a few other things. But unfortunately, within the past 10 minutes, um, I've had problems with an internet connection on my computer. So I had to do a quick switch with my wife um, using her computer. So uh, let me just say that it's been a pretty crazy uh, 10 minutes or so. But um, we'll take a couple of deep breaths and, uh, and just move on from here. Um, I've always been very interested in what's known as popular culture and uh, and especially since I've been at Mystic Seaport, the way that it connects Americans and their maritime heritage. So um, even if someone lives in Kansas, uh, maybe one of you um, participating in this lives in the Midwest, for example, you may be far from the ocean. Uh, you may have never seen the ocean when you grew up, but you've seen images of sailors and ships in advertising, in the movies, in television, in literature. Um, it's just, it's all around us and it's a reflection of our important connections to the sea. And, and one aspect of popular culture and what we're looking at today um, are the movies and specifically movies with connections to whales and whaling. Um, and it's interesting because uh, and it, well, also, as, as Libby said, I, I had an opportunity to work in uh, work in Hollywood for a couple of years. And although the union I worked for uh, primarily did television work, um, I did work uh, at a number of movie studios. I worked at the old Warner Brothers lot, at Universal, um, the old Columbia lot, and a couple of others. Um, so had had some experiences to, to be around it a little bit. And a lot of the technology in television and the movies is, uh, is identical. Um, Whaling is a subject that's been well represented in, in American popular culture. Uh, let's see, I am just going to take one second here and get my PowerPoint started. Okay. So are you seeing the PowerPoint okay? The first slide says whaling in the movies. Fred, we're not yes. seeing it yet. You, you are, you're not? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Uh, let's see. It should just be screen share and yeah. select. Oh. There you go. Okay, so you are, okay, so you've got it now? We do, yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Looks Sorry great. About that. No worries. Um, and, and again, um, let's see. Okay. So whaling is a subject, as I said, that's been well represented in movies. Um, and as the motion picture industry gained momentum in the early 20th century, whaling was something that they looked to as a subject of surprisingly uh, fairly often because it, it offered audiences appeal in the form of action, adventure, danger, 
um, classic confrontations between man and nature. Uh, and so it, it had a lot to offer. It was a fitting topic for movies. And there have been dozens and dozens of movies about whales and whaling. Um, I'll discuss some of these, including some of the most important and interesting examples. And uh, one, one major question to consider is uh, how realistic are some of these movies or do they have any documentary value? And actually some of them do. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, this is a case of uh, some images from uh, the movie Down to the Sea and Ships, um, and uh, which I'll be talking about shortly. And these are uh, promotional photographs that would have been hung in theaters. Um, in terms of accuracy and realism, it's not here. Um, this guy who looks like he's um, kind of hanging on for dear life onto a whale's flukes is, uh, it, that, let's just say that's not a real image. Um, and then you have something like this. This is not from a, um, a whaling movie, but it is a movie with ships. And it's a, it's a pretty dramatic looking scene. This is a ship that's in serious trouble. Um, but is it a real ship? Well, if you look at this and look in the lower right, it's, it's a model in a tank. Um, and there's the, the, the guy who's in charge of it, uh, managing it. So that's kind of uh, an example, uh, a couple of classic examples of, uh, of Hollywood uh, faking. And, um, but that being said, there are some uh, impressive elements of realism in, in some of the movies. And uh, in fact, at least five actual whale ships have appeared in movies including the Charles W. Morgan, which, which as, as most of you know, is, or all of you know, is now preserved at Mystic Seaport. So I'll start by taking a look at some of the earliest whaling related films. Um, this is one called Miss Petticoats. It definitely doesn't sound like a whaling movie. Uh, and it's not really, uh, it's a silent film released in 1916. So, so we're over, uh, over 100 years in the past. Um, and it's the earliest non-documentary film with ties to whaling that I've been able to find. And even though it, it, it wasn't about whaling, it had scenes shot in New Bedford. And some of those scenes featured the Charles, Charles W. Morgan um, as a ship called the Harpoon. So this was the Charles W. Morgan's first acting role, uh, even though there was no whaling content in the movie. So this is 1916. Um, and, uh, and again, you've got the Morgan, a, a real whale ship, appearing in a movie, a silent movie at this time. Now, jumping ahead, this, this movie in 1923, another silent movie, is, is a completely different story. This is uh, a very important movie on multiple levels, and, and uh, it, it is all about whaling. Uh, that's the point of it. Um, it, it really ranks as the most remarkable of the, of the whaling movies. Uh, it's not a typical Hollywood film. It was created, funded, and produced largely by a group of citizens in New Bedford. And they saw it as a, uh, a memorial to whaling, which was almost completely gone in New Bedford. Um, after decades of history, uh, whaling was, was within a few years of its end at this time. Uh, it was filmed in 1922, released in 23. Um, so it was, it was organized and it was the idea of New Bedford people. And they, uh, they formed a corporation and they hired a director, Elmer Clifton, who had trained with movie making pioneer uh, D.W. Griffith. So, uh, so the director, Clifton, had, had pretty impressive credentials. And Down to the Sea and Ships combines romance and adventure, uh, and it includes a lot of whaling activity. Um, actress Marguerite Courteau portrays Patience Morgan. She's the daughter of a whale ship owner, and her love interest is played by a leading man named Raymond McKee uh, as Alan Dexter, who is Shanghai'd and finds himself on a whaling voyage. So here are some shots of McKee, who's a, an actor and a shot of McKee in, uh, in the crow's nest looking for whales, um, probably about you know, four feet off the ground here in a studio um, and not really on a ship, but uh, so, and then this is, uh, 
McKee with Marguerite Courteau. At McKee, his, his character succeeds as a whaler. He harpoons a whale. Um, there's a lot of whaling activity. There's a mutiny and other action. And the ship is represented as the Charles W. Morgan. Um, it eventually returns home. The sweethearts are reunited and all is well. This is Clara Bow, uh, who, uh, who appeared in the movie. She, this was really her first breakout role. Uh, she was very young at this time, um, but she had a feature role in the film. Many of the scenes in the movie are pure Hollywood fabrication, but the film does provide a number of glimpses of New Bedford's historic whaling industry, including Merrill's Wharf, which was a major whaling wharf, uh, a number of whaling related buildings, the Charles W. Morgan, and also the Bark Wanderer, which was another whaling bark. Um, but there's been a lot of confusion over the years about what is real in this movie and what isn't. And the film's publicity is actually a bit of a hoax, uh, especially on two key points. First, that the whaling voyage and the whale ship sailing sequences were filmed on the Charles W. Morgan, and that the leading man, Raymond McKee, actually harpooned a whale. Uh, and before and after the film's release, people associated with the movie contributed to this misinformation and these myths. Um, for example, McKee and director Clifton stated in published accounts that the Morgan was used for the whaling voyage. That's not true. The Morgan never left the dock in New Bedford. Um, the, official the official film publicity also stated that McKee had actually harpooned a whale. Um, or one of the whales taken during the voyage and had been thrown into the water by a, when the whale destroyed his boat. And even McKee's son believes his father harpooned a whale. So the truth is, again, that the Morgan never left Buzzards Bay. It did not participate in a whaling voyage for this movie. Um, and this is uh, the Wanderer, uh, in, in many ways, the, the sister ship to, to the Morgan because they're two of the last surviving uh, sort of traditional whaling barks. Uh, the, uh, the publicity implied that the scene, scenes of the whale ship under sail were the Morgan, and they were not. They were the Wanderer. So, so the whaling bark that you see in this movie is the Wanderer, even though, it's, uh, even though the film people would have us believe it's the Morgan. Now, the other point, as far as McKee harpooning a whale, um, uh, that's a scene, uh, these are both scenes from the movies. Um, and uh, it, it's highly unlikely, it's, it's really impossible. Hollywood actors are valuable commodities and uh, dangerous assignments in movies are always performed by stunt people. Um, if you have a high paid actor, you don't risk serious injury to them, which is gonna hold up production, cost you, a great deal of money. Uh, it, it just was rarely, rarely done. And so someone who's never been on a whaling voyage is not about, uh, is an actor, uh, is not about to harpoon a whale. So it, it, it definitely didn't happen. And it's interesting that uh, there's a newspaper article that was published before the filming began. And one, and the title of the uh, article is, No Star Will Throw a Harpoon. So uh, I think they might have uh, regretted that they had made that statement at one point because they did promote the fact that McKee um, did harpoon a whale, but he, he most certainly did not. And if you look at the, the image on the bottom, um, you know, how do you, how do you get that, that shot uh, if that's real? You have uh, someone traveling in front of the whale at the same speed as the whale, you know, looking backwards towards the whale boat, um, just, just not possible. So, um, Hollywood, Hollywood fakery, um, and more of that here, the, the classic Nantucket sleigh ride, as it's called, when a harpoon whale would tow a whale boat at high speed. Um, a pretty dramatic event uh, when it happened, and it's not surprising that the filmmakers chose to include it because, uh, because it is a, it, it, uh, pretty impressive. So if you look at these images, you, you have the impression that um, that McKee it is in a boat going through this experience, um, and, and he's not. Um, in a couple of things going on here. For one thing, um, the uh, 
the boat that's speeding along is being towed by a power boat. Um, a couple of other things, the, uh, for any fast scenes in movies at this time, uh, the film would be speeded up. Uh, was a classic trick used for um, car chases and, and uh, rail train scenes, uh, horses running, all sorts of things. You, you would film up the speed to make the action look as though it was happening faster than it really was. Um, so so the, the Nantucket sleigh ride scene in this movie is faked. So if all of this is faked, what is real? Well, the film does have some documentary value. There are New Bedford scenes, as I mentioned earlier. There are homes, uh, the Siemens Bethel, which is a church. Uh, there are wharf scenes. There's an oil refinery. And there was a whaling voyage. Um, this is a, a, a schooner that was leased from the Gordon Pugh um, Fish Company in Gloucester and fitted out to look like a whaler um, a veteran whaling captain was hired. Uh, some veteran whalers, New Bedford whalers, were also hired. And the vessel did go on a whaling voyage um, to the West Indies. So, so you do have a, a, a whaling voyage. And McKee and a number of the film crew are on board. Um, and it's interesting that one of the, the real whalers who was hired, um, Theophilo Freitas, um, who actually did kill a large whale during the voyage, um, had served on the Charles W. Morgan. So a man who participated in this movie is a veteran of the Charles W. Morgan. But the actors didn't do any whaling here. And, uh, and the whaling sequences um, are, are not authentic. Um, but, but they did make the effort um, and hired real whalers to do this. And there are some clues here uh, that this is not uh, the Morgan. And one is if you, uh, if you know your um, rigged vessels, and if you look at uh, the far right of this image, you'll see mast hoops. We don't have mast hoops on a, uh, on, on a bark, a, a, a vessel that's rigged like the Morgan. So uh, that's, that's an indication that that this is a schooner and not the, uh, not the Morgan. And you can also see the davit on the left for, for one of the whale boats and it looks kind of patched together. Doesn't look, uh, doesn't look uh, like anything very substantial. So the whaling voyage was faked, um, but there were some aspects of this movie uh, uh, like this filmed in New Bedford. These are all actors and local people in costume. And that is the Morgan at the end of the wharf. So that's a, a authentic shot of the Morgan um, right at the very end of her whaling days. So that, that has historic value. And there are other images that do. Um, this is a deck scene on board the Morgan, uh, Morgan. So again, this is a visual record of the Morgan right at the end of her whaling days. And the cruise quarters, or the foc'sle, um, that's McKee, the actor, uh, in a scene from the movie. And on the right is a scene uh, taken on board uh, the actual Morgan more recently. Um, and looks pretty similar, uh, and, and it is. It's, uh, it's the same space on the same ship. And this one uh, is interesting, too, because this is the captain's cabin on the Morgan. Um, on the right is a photo that I took a few years ago. And on the left is a scene from the movie featuring Clara Bow, and it is uh, the same space. So the, the scene of the captain's cabin, again, you're seeing what the, uh, the captain's cabin on the Morgan looked like within a year of the Morgan retiring from whaling. So, so there's documentary value here. Uh, these are scenes of the Morgan um, taken on the waterfront in, in New Bedford. So again, uh, you know, more scenes depicting the Morgan. But I think down to the sea and ships is, is important for another reason. Um, if you look at this, uh, this slide, you'll see these dates. Um, in this four year period, the Morgan returns from her final voyage, down to the sea and ships is released, 
The Wanderer, which is um, along with the Morgan, one of the last uh, whaling barks, is wrecked. The John R. Manta makes the last successful New Bedford whaling voyage. That ends New England whaling. And whaling enshrined is established to preserve the Charles W. Morgan. So what you see in this four-year period is a transition from real whaling to memorializing whaling. Um, and there's, there's a shift here, this time period between the wars, between World War I and World War II. Um, whaling has just ended and already um, there are various efforts and activities underway to memorialize it and to remember it and to kind of pay tribute to it. And so down to the sea and ships is very much a part of this, a part of this movement, a part of this transition from real whaling to memorializing whaling. So I think the movie is, is, is really important for that reason. So what became of the principal actors? Well, uh, life imitated art and uh, the two co-stars, Raymond McKee and Marguerite Courtou actually married, um, had a, a, enjoyed a long successful marriage, stayed away from the Hollywood social scene, uh, kept kind of a low profile and uh, met you know, met filming the movie and and uh, and married and 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 enjoyed a long long marriage, um, and I, I actually had some contact a few years ago with their son, and according to him, they were both very proud of their work in Down to the Sea and Ships. Um, the film's subject matter inspired Raymond McKee because he became, uh, or he developed a lifelong interest in maritime matters. Um, they, uh, the McKees moved to Hawaii and uh, he collected nautical antiques. He also got interested in scrimshaw and uh, he collected it and he learned how to do scrimshaw. Um, this is a tooth that I think was uh, most likely done from, from a, um, or done by one of the whalers who participated in the movie, done for Raymond McKee. And so it's really interesting because it's a, it's a real tooth, the work of a real whaler, and, but the scenes are depictions from the movie. So you can see McKee, you can see um, other cast members, you can see the camera person. Uh, so it's a nice record, uh, a, a unique artifact um, and it came to us from, uh, from Raymond McKee's son a number of years ago with, with part of a collection, as did this one. And this is an example of Raymond McKee's work. Um, again, he, he got interested in this. Uh, they lived in Hawaii, and this looks like it's dated 64. Uh, and when McKee was in Hawaii, you could still get um, sperm whale teeth uh, from Japanese whalers. And... So he had access to it and learned how to do it. Um, Clara Bow um, became a, a Hollywood star and um, you know, became, became quite famous, um, but she, uh, she had serious problems. Her career ended early due to a combination of um, health issues, scandals, and the fact that she had a thick Brooklyn accent that didn't work too well when sound pictures came in. So uh, sort of a, an unhappy ending to her life. Um, it's interesting that in 1923, the year that Down to the Sea and Ships was released, two other whaling related movies were made that same year. Um, one is this one. So this is a movie called The Love Nest with Buster Keaton. And Keaton is a very prominent, um, very famous uh, comedian, comedic actor uh, in, in his time. And this movie is set on a whaler. And the whale ship is called The Love Nest. And it's about a whaling voyage and an abusive captain who, uh, when, when uh, people act up in any way on the ship. He just throws them overboard. So it's a, it's a 20 minute short. Um, there are a few brief scenes depicting actual whales and the firing of a harpoon gun, but not much documentary value in this. Um, it's pure entertainment. The other 1923 whaling film is different. Um, it's called um, All the Brothers Were Valiant. Um, this is an article about it and um, and it's interesting because, uh, well, Down to the Sea and Ships was 
being filmed in New Bedford on the other side of the country uh, at almost the exact same time this film was being shot in California. Um, it focused on what was then modern Pacific Coast whaling which employed uh, motorized boats and harpoon cannons. And even though whaling had ended in New England and on the East Coast, um, it was still very much a presence on the West Coast. And that is what's represented in All the Brothers Were Valiant. It featured Lon Chaney uh, and actress Billy Dove, both prominent actors. It also employed two actual whaling vessels, the three-masted auxiliary schooner, Carolyn Francis, and a steamer catcher boat, the Port Saunders. So the film does have some realism and some documentary value. Um, and that, uh, the, the part of the image that's circled is the Port Saunders. So this is a, a, a magazine article about actual whaling. Um, and then this particular vessel is acquired by Hollywood and used in a movie. So uh, a very direct connection between real whaling and the movies in this case. In 1922, almost immediately after the Morgan appeared in Down to Sea and Ships, um, she traveled to Salem, Massachusetts to appear in a movie called Java Head. Um, and this is a sea tale, but, but she represented a merchant ship, not a whaler. Um, but this is uh, an, actual, an actual whale ship, again, in a movie, and it, and it is the Morgan. Um, and you can see, um, at this time, um, they had painted the, the name of the ship as Nautilus, and you can just barely see it uh, here below the, the lettering, the actual lettering for Charles W. Morgan. So that's a Hollywood edition where it says Nautilus, uh, but traces of it still existed at this point. This is a movie that I just found out about uh, about three or four weeks ago. And uh, it's another movie related to whaling. And I was especially interested in this because I've done a lot of research on Arctic whaling. And that's what this movie was about. This is another silent movie, 1926, um, in the tentacles of the North. Um, this was apparently, um, I, I've watched bits of it. Uh, I have not watched the whole thing, uh, but it was not very highly regarded. Here's, here's what one reviewer had to say about it. He mentions, the cast of hams, frozen-faced hero, the deadly dull heroine, and goes on to describe it as a miserable, static, almost totally actionless, inept, and totally uninvolving, disappointingly flat, and almost entirely bereft of artistry. So how's that for a review? review? That makes you just want to go out and see if you can find it on Netflix. Um, it sounds like a pretty dreadful movie, and, um, but it was about whaling, so, so we're talking about it. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because um, they did include these, this corny scene of a, of a fake model and the fake Arctic and the fake ice, and that's exactly what it looks like, I think. You know, I, I guess, you know, viewers weren't quite, weren't quite as discriminating then as, as they are now. You know, we're... we're um, we're snobs about accuracy and things like that. But um, so I guess you could get by with that. But if you compare it to this, um, this is uh, seen from the movie on the left. And then on the right is an image from our collection. Um, that's a New Bedford whaling schooner era under the command of Connecticut whaling captain George Comer. And that's taken in 1904 in Hudson Bay. So that's a real New England whaler in, uh, in the Arctic. Um, so you have um, reality on the right and um, something much less than reality on the left. Um, but, but again, another, you know, another whaling movie. This is The Sea Beast um, in uh, 1926, another silent. Um, and it was the first in a succession of film versions of the novel Moby Dick but it was not called Moby Dick, it was called the Sea Beast. Um, but you can see that Moby Dick is mentioned in, in the publicity up here. Um, one thing that, that's um, interesting to me about this, uh, and I didn't know this uh, until a few years ago, but it was filmed, uh, it was a Warner Brothers production um, and filmed on the Warner Brothers lot in Hollywood. And I actually worked on that lot many, many times. Um, it, it had changed hands uh, was still a major production film 
uh, filming center, but mostly for television when I worked there, but all the original buildings and studios were there. And uh, little did I know that, uh, that I would be on the site where this, this first film version of, uh, of Moby Dick was made. So called the Sea Beast um, with John Barrymore. So this is, this is a big deal in Hollywood um, with Barrymore at this point, because he's a major figure, a major actor. Um, and here's how one reviewer described, described him. Mr. Barrymore's makeup is perfect. His hair is wet most of the time, long and unkempt. His eyes are bleary and vicious, and he snarls at his men, having only one thought in mind, to find and kill Moby Dick. So uh, that reviewer thought this one was pretty convincing, and apparently uh, um, Barrymore did a good job. The whaleboat scenes were what are called process shots, um, and what they would do is uh, use bouncing reproduction whale boats in a studio um, using either springs or some hydraulic system to rock the boat and move the boat uh, and then put a green screen behind it um, so that uh, that could be separated and all you would have left would be the boats and the people in it and then add a layer um, of, of actual outdoor footage uh, whatever it may be and that idea of, of layering um, of, of combining two, two images into a single frame is a standard in Hollywood that goes back uh, about 115 years. Um, and we think of it mostly today as, um, as green screen technology and um, actually had been set up here before my computer failure to show you how that works uh, with Zoom. It's built into Zoom software so that I can put a uh, green fabric behind me, select an image um, and as my background, and you will see whatever that image is in the background and, and me in the foreground. And it's a, it's a common feature of Zoom. Um, and, and it's a feature that's a variant is used extensively in the movies. Um, but the idea, and there, it's, it's taken many forms uh, before there was green screen Blue screens were used. Before that, black drape curtains were used and it was much more complicated. But it's changed dramatically with digital technology. It's called compositing today. But the idea is the same. Multiple layers merge to give you the idea of, of uh, something that is not really happening. You, you have, uh, usually you have actors in, in, a, in a very controlled scene in a studio, that's one layer. And the second layer is whatever you want. It's a, usually an outdoor shot, could be the ocean, you know, could be the ocean in a storm, it could be uh, traveling through the mountains. But, but that layering is a standard feature of, of motion picture special effects um, used, used in, uh, basically all the whaling uh, movies that we're talking about. Another shot of uh, Barrymore. And another interesting aspect of this is that um, the movie was distinctive for another reason, not just Barrymore. Warner Brothers bought an actual whaling vessel to use in the movie. Uh, she was the narwhal, which had been launched as a steam whaler in 1883 and made a number of whaling voyages. So you have a whale ship actually owned by a major Hollywood studio. And, uh, you know, I think that's, a, that's a, an interesting link between the two ideas, whaling and movies. A sound version of Moby Dick was released by Warner Brothers in 1930. And again, it starred uh, John Barrymore uh, plus Joan Bennett as Ahab's fiance. Um, this is jumping ahead a little bit to um, a movie that was released and then re-released. Uh, first called I Conquer the Sea, and then there was enough interest in it apparently to re-release it 11 years later as the Sea Bandits. And it, it is a whaling movie. Um, this is an interesting publicity photo, and I can't really figure it out. Um, but it's very odd to see to see a woman in this case in in, in a whaleboat with a harpoon, um, you know, taken on a California beach somewhere. But it's never been quite clear to me what what the point of this is. It doesn't seem to have any uh, any relation to the actual movie, but uh, some sort of a publicity 
um, promotional shot, but interesting because uh, um, a woman appears in it in, in, in a traditional whaling activity. Um, There had been two earlier versions of this. All the brothers were valiant. Um, first released in 1923 and then again in 1928. In the second one, Joan Crawford appeared in it, um, but it didn't have whaling content. But in 1953, this version did have whaling content. It starred Robert, Robert Taylor, Stuart Granger, and Ann Blythe. It was a 1953 production and it included whaling sequences, but they were pure Hollywood special effects. And you can see that here. Um, this is a boat that's been smashed to pieces by a whale. And if you look at the bottom, you see the two of the, the victims, two of the men in the boats. Um, and in the close-up detail, it's a little hard to tell, but these are rubber floating dummies. These are not real people. So this is, you know, filmed in a filmed in a tank on a Hollywood lot somewhere, um, and uh, made to look like uh, made to look like whaling. Moby Dick in 1956 is, is probably the, the best known whaling related movie um, in part because it's, it's more recent, um, but also because it's, uh, it's closer to a classic treatment of, of the story as written by Herman Melville. I mean, certainly there are Hollywood liberties, but, um, but it does follow that storyline much more than most of the other movies. Um, movies had changed dramatically by this time with the introduction of sound in, in uh, 1927 and color in 1939. And so this movie obviously had both and it also had iconic director John Huston and actor Gregory Peck as Ahab. Um, it was released in 1956 and it tells the tale with a flair. Um, Mystic Seaport's curator at the time, Edward Stackpole, um, provided information um, to the director, John Huston, um, and uh, just learned that recently from, from one of Mr. Stackpole's sons who is, uh, has been affiliated with the Seaport in recent years. Um, director Houston needed a real captain to sail the Pequod, the whale ship in this movie. And he found one in Alan Villiers, an author, a renowned sailor, a sail training pioneer, and the former owner of Mystic Seaport's square rigger, Joseph Conrad. So this is the schooner Rylance that was acquired for the film, converted to look like a whaler. Uh, the Rylance um, was a cargo carrying vessel uh, operating mostly, mostly in the North Sea, but it also had some movie history at this point because it had been used in the Disney version of Treasure Island in 1950. So in the lower left, you can see the Disney version um, as a pirate ship. So it's a, it's a schooner carrying cargo in real life, becomes a pirate ship in a Disney film, and becomes a whaler in a treatment of Moby Dick. The uh, Villiers was not very uh, complimentary of the whole filming experience. He described it uh, in one of his books as a maritime melee chasing a rubbery whale with a completely bogus and unseaworthy ship in the Irish Sea. So he didn't think too much of the experience. He was uh, also amused by the various mechanical whales that were used. And in one instance, he noted, and I quote, Dick himself was there, wallowing a wash on a tow line from the tug, blowing realistically by means of a compressed air system, ingeniously contrived inside his iron ribs. He was a brute to tow and impossible to harpoon. The new skin stretched round him to replace some, of the, some that had worn off was so thick and strong that no harpoon would go through it. So um, interesting. Another thing that, uh, that I've read about this movie is that apparently um, one of the uh, mechanical whales got away, uh, um, slipped its line and, and went adrift in the North Sea and was uh, was listed as as a as a menace or a hazard to shipping for quite some time before I guess eventually it, it either uh, was found or it sank. But uh, but there was this dangerous um, 
white whale um, in the North Sea for some time uh, as a threat to shipping. So unfortunately, you know, it was a fake. Um, these are some scenes. Uh, actually, if you look at the left, that's a, a scene from the movie. On the right, you can see the model. Uh, this is a model and casting of figures uh, that were used for this scene. So um, good, good detail here, very accurate model. Um, or, or more accurate than, than some of what we've, we've looked at. Um, so the parade of whaling and whale related movies didn't end with Moby Dick in 1956. And uh, not surprisingly, filmmakers continued to be inspired by Melville's classic. And there have been a couple made for TV versions and in this one, uh, this, this theatrical release, Moby Dick 2010, um, submarines battle an enormous monster whale. So I, I haven't, uh, haven't been able to bring myself to watch this one yet, but uh, it's another, another whaling related movie. If you're bored some night um, and you want a, a more contemporary take on the, on the Moby Dick story. So in more recent years, you have In the, in the Heart of the Sea. And um, it was directed by Ron Howard and starred Chris Hemsworth, who played Thor in the Avengers um, superhero movies. And it's based on a true story of a whale ship rammed and sunk by a whale in 1820, the Essex. Um, and it was an event that inspired Melville. It's an event that Melville was aware of. Um, and... Uh, Ron Howard was, was drawn to the story and uh, decided to, to do a film version of it. He came to Mystic Seaport in 2013 um, with a small group to do some research. Um, he spent some time with a few of us in the Collections Research Center. This is him in our shipyard, but he did uh, come into the Collections Research Center. And uh, that was kind of fun for me because I had a chance to remind him that 30 years earlier, um, I was working um, at NBC and a TV special was being filmed. It was some sort of um, Disney anniversary special. And Ron Howard, who was then a major TV star, was, was making a guest appearance on this. And so at one point inside the studio, we passed each other and just as a courtesy, we just both said hello. Uh, and that was the extent of it. That was the extent of my relationship with Ron Howard. Um, but I reminded, reminded him that we had uh, crossed paths, you know, 30 years before, and uh, he seemed to, to uh, get a kick out of that. And when he left the Collections Research Center, he said, nice to see you again with a smile, you know, as, as if we were uh, dear acquaintances. But, um, but he spent some time there, um, worked on the movie. Unfortunately, the movie was not a major commercial success. It relied extensively on special effects and what's called in the business today, CGI, computer generated imagery. And that's a, a major, major aspect of, of a lot of filmmaking today. Um, and for this movie, one reference I saw indicated that the technical staff had created about a petabyte of data. Well, I wasn't quite sure what that was. Um, so, I, so I looked it up. I, and found that a petabyte is about a million gigabytes. So that inspired me to do some math. And I came up with the fact that one petabyte equals about 31,000 of these, which is a 32 gigabyte flash drive. And so if 31,000 of these and the information they contain uh, are used to to uh, to produce the special effects in a Hollywood movie. Um, it, I don't think anything could underscan, underscore more strongly the importance of uh, computer generated graphics and imagery in the film business today. And um, I watched In the Heart of the Sea recently, and it was interesting to me. I think at the very end, possibly the last thing on the credits, the the, the last image shown were the credits for the for the technical people. And there are, there had to be a husband, I didn't count them, but there had to be a hundred. Um, so it, it just, uh, this is, this movie is very, very much about um, contemporary technology. And I can give you some examples of some of the effects used in this movie. So 
on the top, you see um, this farm uh, seen in the movie, and you'll you note that on the top, it's surround, surrounded by this blue wall, and that is a, a version of a green screen. Later on, it lets you separate the, the farm and add a background, and that's what's happened below. This painting, this coastal view has replaced the the blue background and so the the in the lower view the the coastal scene is is what's called a mat um and it's it could be hand painted uh probably hand painted and then um and then digitized and then sized as needed but it goes back to what was happening a hundred years ago layering you know you use you use technology that's available to combine two layers to give the effect of, of some something or some activity happening somewhere else. And this is another scene that I like from the movie. Um, again, this is in the heart of the sea and the same thing. Here's a blue, here's a blue screen um, and you see the balcony here, um, a portion of the building, three people, and here they're replaced by a mat again. So you've, you've shot this, you you use the techno digital technology to separate the right corner image and then you put that background you put it on that background and um, the layering effect once again and this is a little bit different uh, but this is also from uh, in the heart of the sea um, three scenes showing a whale boat uh, and those are mannequins in the whale boat um, and again, surrounded by a blue screen, which you can, can remove. And what you have on the left in the, in the far left slide or image is a, a chute and a, a massive quantity of water is, is being dropped down. And the, the effect is that of a massive wave breaking over the whale boat. And so that's what you see in the movie. But this is how it happened. It happened in a tank inside a studio uh, that's set up for this um, special sort of water drop technology, just, just to create one scene. This is uh, an, another example of, of sort of ships and water, and this is a studio view. Um, you can see the blue screen again in the background. It's, it's basically a, a tank, a swimming pool, um, and a model. And so, um, especially in older movies, you, you can really, if you look closely, you can tell that they're models. Um, and, and major studios, like the MGM studios a number of years ago had a major, major sale of their equipment, their props. And in the auction catalogs, there were many, many ship models. Um, and, and so they have been a staple in Hollywood, the use of models for, for many years. We actually have a model at Mystic Seaport, a movie model uh, was made for, it's a steamboat, Fulton steamboat, the Claremont. Um, was used for a 1940s movie. So I mean, I'm glad that we have that because it, we, have, uh, we have hundreds of models, but to have one that was actually movie used uh, it is kind of interesting. So I wanted to finish with a slightly different story and this one combines movies and whaling in a different way. Uh, this is a shot of a part of the coast in California. Point Doom is here. And uh, just north of it is Zuma Beach and Westward Beach. Um, and uh, I have to tell you that this is um, Westward Beach here, right where that red dot is, is uh, was one of my favorite escapes when I lived in Los Angeles because there are cliffs behind it. So all you see are the cliffs behind you, the beach and, and the water. Um, so just, just a, a good place to relax. And, um, but the other thing that you can do on this beach um, certain times of the year um, is watch whales uh, because the California gray whales migrate um, from northern waters to Baja California, um, breed and give birth, and then they come back up north and they travel very close to the California coast. And because there's a point here, uh, they tend to pass fairly close to this area. And on more than one occasion, I saw whales from the beach. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting for that reason. Just south of this point is Malibu. 
and uh, this is an area called Paradise Cove Beach. Uh, right here is uh, Surfriders Beach, which is one of the most famous surfing beaches in the world. Uh, there's a famous pier there. Um, and the other thing about this area, this entire area, this is a, this whole Malibu area is extremely exclusive. And many of Hollywood's rich and famous um, live in homes along the coast here, dozens and dozens. Um, it's a, it's a, a magnet for celebrities because of, because of the, the houses on the cliffs and, and the ocean views. Um, it, it's always been popular for, the, for those reasons. So a very exclusive area. Um, the, the entire area has always been a popular filming location, probably for close to 100 years. And one reason it's popular for that reason is because it, it provides great coastal scenery and it's within what is called the 30 mile zone. Um, this is something that was established by the movie industry uh, decades ago. And it, it centers at a, what was a, a, I guess a major um, film industry business office in the center of Hollywood, extends out 30 miles in every direction. And within that circle, um, was one category of, uh, of rates for um, employees, for technicians, for actors, for camera people. If you went beyond 30 miles, the rate went up. It got more expensive. You had to provide more meals. You had to provide lodging. Um, so they tried to film as much as they could, uh, including outdoor scenes when they had to leave the studio, uh, and they still do try to film as much as they can within the 30 mile zone. And this area, the Malibu and Point Doom area, is with just barely within the 30 mile zone. So it gave them a great coastal filming area that was in the, not really the bargain district because there's nothing um, cut rate about the movie industry. But um, so it became very popular and, and many movies were, were filmed in, the, in this region. Um, and here's some shots. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually very near where I used to go to the beach. Um, and Point Doom is right here. And this is a scene of Point Doom, a scene from one of the Planet of the Apes movies um, that, that uses you know, the area that I just showed you. A number of movies um, shot in this region were shot in, in this area. Paradise Cove uh, has been quite built up since then. Um, this is a major uh, sort of um, restaurant and, and resort there. Um, and, and that's located right here. Again, we're in the same area. This, this point right where the uh, cursor is, is where I just showed you um, the scene from Planet of the Apes. So we're around the point, you know, headed south. And, and right here is Paradise Cove. Uh, which is part of part of Malibu. So many movies filmed here before it was built up. Uh, movies, TV shows. And uh, my point here is that during two winters from 1934 to 1936, a major whaling operation that included three ships was based in this circle, just offshore of Paradise Cove. Um, a few hundred yards from the beach, and they killed 250 gray whales in a two and a half year period. And it was the last major whaling operation in North American waters. And it happened within sight of where you now have this resort and all these exclusive homes on the cliffs in Malibu. Um, so real, real whaling had come to the movie capital. And uh, it just, uh, I found that to be a really ironic twist that, that there, this last gasp of, of real whaling happened in Hollywood's backyard. Um, and just to end, I'll say that uh, most whaling movies have been kind of serious, but there have been a few uh, not so serious, such as this one. So this is a cartoon version um, from Disney Studios in 1938 called The Whalers. And it features, uh, you know, Disney stars, um, Goofy, Donald Duck, and Mickey Mouse, and they're on a whale ship. And it's interesting that, you know, we have our vision of, of whaling in New England and, it, and of whaling vessels, and the Charles W. Morgan is, represents that vision. Well, 
you know, in, in California in the 1930s and 20s, um, they're seeing vessels like this, catcher boats, steam powered whalers. And so um, that's the whale ship that Disney Studios used in, in this cartoon. And um, as the final scene of Down to the Sea and Ships says, um, so ends. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd be glad to uh, hear what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. I see I'm trying to get my video to start up again. Um, there I am. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's very, very interesting. I didn't, uh, so I didn't realize you had celebrity friends. <laughs> yeah, That's <a> great. <laughs> um, we did have a couple of questions. And if you have, if other people have questions, please enter them into the chat. I'll be able to see them now and, and ask them as we go along. Um, but one of the first questions was from one of our viewers. They had thought the Morgan was still with Colonel Green's estate in New Bedford at the time of the filming of um, some of the earlier films. Can you elaborate on what the location of the Morgan was when those films were, were made? Yeah, not, not at Colonel Green's estate then, a little bit later, um, still, still in New Bedford at that time, um, and had just returned from her final voyage, which ended in 1922, and that's when this filming was done. So, yeah, still in New Bedford at Merrill's Wharf, mostly. At the wharf, okay. Um, another question was, um, from your studies, do you think there's a growing trend for accuracy in movies, or do you think it's still kind of on an individual production's prerogative? to try to be accurate? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And I, th I think movies are, are much, much more accurate. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to sound snobby, but I think we're, we're more sophisticated. You know, we, we expect higher quality. We expect more accuracy. You can't, you can't watch a Buster Keaton movie from 1930 and take it seriously. Um, it's just, with digital technology, for example, um, you know, we expect sharp, sharp images and, and uh, really good quality and, and, um, and more attention to detail and content. So I just think the standards, standards are higher. More accuracy is expected. We had a viewer that was wondering if there was a reason that you had omitted the remake of Down to Sea and Ships that starred Lionel Barrymore. Um, no, probably probably an oversight in looking at oh. my notes, but yeah. And uh, it's interesting because it did, yeah, it did include another Barrymore uh, and uh, the brother of, um, of John Barrymore was another whaling movie and uh, set in, set in the 20th century, modern whaling and, and did, did, didn't really have any resemblance to, um, to the first one, but it was a whaling story. Oh, okay. Good point. Um, let's see. Let's see. There was there's a, a comment from um, a couple that have been watching. They said they think there was a parade in New Bedford with the stars from Moby Dick when it was first re released. Do you know? Do you did you come across that um, fact at all in your in your research? That sounds that sounds right. When when Moby okay. Dick was released, it it, it was um, and the same thing with Down to the Sea and Ships because it had such a New Bedford connection. Um, there was. Uh, it was quite a production. And I think for the opening of the movie, um, it, it, I think Moby Dick did premiere in New Bedford and there were associated events and stuff. So that sounds right. Yeah. Okay. And then do you know what the last um, movie was made that, had, that had, did not have sound that depicted whaling? Uh, the last one that didn't have sound, I'd have to go back and check. Um, it, interesting that the, um, that same Warner Brothers, what was the Warner Brothers studio um, where the Sea Beast had been filmed, that same studio was also where, where the first all sound movie was made, uh, The Jazz Singer with Al Jolson. And I happened to be working there on the 50th anniversary of that. And they had a, a celebration with dignitaries and, and everything in honor of that. And it was kind of fun. It never, never would have occurred to me that you know, that that site was, um, had, had that connection, but yeah. But, but um, the transition to sound once it happened um, was pretty dramatic, um, you know, was extensive. 
I bet all the different sound effects they can add to it, to a film. Um, so actually the, the couple that had asked about the parade, um, uh, they said, thank you for your insight because they remember it as a child. So they were actually there. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't oh, that interesting? Great. Yes. Um, another question. If an actual whale was taken by another during the filming of the first Down to Sea in Ships, um, the person was wondering if the star got to harp, like, quote unquote, harpoon the carcass. So if there were, if, if there, I, you, I know that you said the stars didn't really do it as they claimed, but would they have been around if it was? Yeah, I mean, they, anyway? they, yeah, they would have been on the ship. Um, okay. Raymond McKee was on the ship and he was in the vicinity. And, and that's a good, that's a good point. And I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, it's a lot easier to harpoon a, a dead one than it is a living one that's on the run. So um, I suppose that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, good point. And then, do you know if, if what the reason was why they featured the Wanderer um, instead of the Morgan? Um, for one thing, I think the Wanderer was in, in better condition. Um, oh. the, the Morgan at this point was in pretty sad shape. In fact, there's a scene in the movie where um, it, it, it shows, uh, I think it's a night scene and it does show the Morgan and it's sort of a broadside view. And I forget what's going on, but they lower one of the whale boats and the Davit actually breaks and it dumps the boat and the people into the water uh, when they were filming. And so that, that really happened. And it's the Morgan at that point was virtually falling apart to some degree and was, was barely seaworthy. And that's, that's why the Wanderer went, was in slightly better condition. Right, why they switched them out. Um, do we have any, which, which films do we have um, copies of in our collections? Um, I don't know that, you know, we don't really have copies of, okay. of films for, um, for any particular reason, because, um, you know, if we were going to use them or show them, there are, there are licensing issues and things oh, like that. Oh, that's true too. Yes. Yeah. 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 We have things like um, posters and, and um, most of the illustrations, I should mention that most of the illustrations that you're seeing um, are things in our collection. And, um, a lot of the, the posters are, um, or not a lot of the posters, but some of these things and some of the, like the McKee Scrimshaw and things like that are in our, um, Tales of the Whalers exhibit in the Stillman building. So when the museum reopens, um, it's a, it's a good reason to come back or when the, the buildings reopen, come back and go take a look in the whaling exhibit and you can see some of the things that have been uh, depicted in these images. Oh, I didn't realize the scrimshot was featured in the in the yeah, uh, yeah. Voyage of the regular whalers. That's great. So you can actually yeah. see it on hand. Yeah, yeah, a couple pieces of it are. Let's see, I'm just checking the the, the feed here. Um, do you what happened to the what was the fate of the wanderer? Uh, the the wanderer was wrecked in uh, I forget the year, but but mid 1920s uh, was outward bound on her last voyage and didn't get very far and. Um, there are these. There were a lot of photographs because it was wrecked in southern New England, and um, it was kind of a pitiful sight. You know, the crew standing on shore, and they're they've got some of their gear, and uh, the wanderer um, went ashore, and um, you know, I guess eventually had to be towed off and was breaking up. But uh, that was really the. There were a couple of whaling voyages out of New London, or some a few after that, um, but not by whaling barks. They were smaller schooners. Okay. Well, it looks like we've, we've wrapped up with questions. So I just want to thank you so much again, for, for Fred, for all of your, your expertise sure. and, and, and sharing, your, sharing the stories and the insiders look into Hollywood for us. <laughs> oh, sure. And thanks to everyone for, um, again, for their interest and in, in, uh, joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.